them blend in to their environment. And they're just, uh, they'll just quickly get through that food. I think they've almost done it. Those few prawns there. The uh, surgeon fish, they're fairly opportunistic feeders. You clean them up and put them to the the northern part of our marine park, North Solitary Islands, and at Lord Howe Island. And the reason why they're endemic to this area in Lord Howe, uh, Lord Howe is the southern limit of the East Australian current when it kicks out. Um, so these species travel on that current out to Lord Howe. They're defined by that wide band, that's why we call them the wide band and enemy fish. And these ones were bred here in captivity. They do have a symbiotic relationship with their host anemones, and we actually have two anemones these fish can comfortably live amongst within the marine park. And this is the pink leathery sea anemone, and the little white tip one is a bubble anemone. Now the largest coverage of anemones on the seabed floor anywhere in the whole world is at North Solitary Islands. And that uh, was discovered only a few years ago through some work by Dr Anna Scott. Um, who works here at the Marine Science Centre and she actually published her work on the anemones and that's how they discovered that we actually do have such an extensive coverage. But because they have, uh, they are the host or the home or the habitat for the wide-band anemone fish, we have lots of fish. We have lots of anemones and therefore lots and lots of fish. Now what they do, the anemones actually contain stinging cells. So they shoot almost like harpoons uh, out of passing fish, those tentacles are very sticky and they will push the fish into a mouth located right in the centre of the disc. The reason why they don't eat the clownfish or sting the clownfish is because he actually builds his own immunity. So the minute the little clownfish are born, they swim inside those stinging cells and they actually stimulate the, uh, the uh, nematocysts, which are the little stinging barbs, and it creates a special mucus coating. Then the anemone actually doesn't recognise the fish as food anymore, so that's why the anemone doesn't stick onto it and start pushing it into the mouth. In return, the anemone fish will look after the anemone by keeping it clean, um, by uh, feeding the anemone. The more food he places inside his anemone, the faster it grows and the more habitat and safety he gets from his predators. So when a predator does come swimming by, you'll see them, they duck down and they will hide safely inside. There's a little bit of aggression there. Now with the anemone fish, oh, he's getting hounded. He's pulling. They're all boys. They all start life out as male fish. Now these ones are approaching three years of age. By the time they get to that third year, you can see there's an incredible size variation. They were all born and spawned at the same time. But we can see they're losing their yellow fins as they start to mature and the greater in size. Now it's the largest fish in a group of male fish that will suddenly change into an egg laying female. Only one of those fish out of a whole brood of males. Um, she will then only have one male out of that group to fertilise her eggs. She cleans a little nest side of algae off the rock. She'll go and lay a couple of hundred eggs very close to an enemy. He'll go behind and fertilise. She just swims off then for a happy life. It's Dad who does all the work, just like at home. No, no, they're really agreeing to that. Um, and so Dad will fend off all the predators and he constantly takes control over anything that comes near. He uh, will aerate them with his little fins and, and uh, he actually even mouths every individual egg to check the growth rate of his new family. After about 10 days they start off as bright orange eggs and end up pretty silver by the time they're ready to hatch. But they are born with the bands and uh, this is our first successful batch in four years of research to be able to provide them to the aquarium trade. Now, that just takes the pressure off collecting them in the wild. They are a favourite uh, marine fish to have in the aquarium trade, but also due to the popularity of the movie Finding Nemo. Every kid in the world wanted a clownfish. Um, the unfortunate thing is, is they do 
depend on a host anemone for habitat for survival. Um, but in the Asian Pacific regions, in order to collect the fish, they bombed their coral reefs uh, with chlorine bombs. And they would just collect the fish that did survive from the top. But they did decimate hundreds of acres of coral reef. So now that we're successfully breeding, we are helping to reduce that uh, taking of marine fish from the environment. Here in Australia, we have really good, strict permits in order to collect any fish species. Even for us being an educational centre as a marine science centre, we have to have very strict uh, rules and regulations in, for, in collecting and returning fish species. So, but it did take four years to get successful breeding. Now, I'll put some food in. Nah, they know. Who says fish don't remember? You will see they'll take food down and place it into their host anemone. And you will see the anemones actually grab themselves. We've got a little friend that's come out to get some food. Can you see what that is? It's a crab. It's a little hermit crab there with a pretty good camouflage. So that little, oh, you just got a whack. That little stripy fish in the aquarium is used for biological control. You will see the stripies throughout most of the tanks because they do eat a pest ectasia, which is a type of anemone that can turn into thousands in a captive environment. So you'll see they've got the pieces of prawn. They'll, uh, they'll eat some for themselves. They'll actually store it in their own anemone because that way they can chase out the other clownfish if they try and steal it. They're very clever at collecting <coughs> and harvesting.